We're going to go to Mary, and Mary's from Okotoks, and we had the privilege of staying in her home when we did Resurgence Calgary. Her and her husband, Marshall, are at Carith Creek uh, Retreats, and they work with Focus on the Family and do some incredible stuff. And as I was praying for this, I just felt we had to have her share. And so, uh, Mary, go ahead and share what God put on your heart, and then we will go into some time of reflection again. I want to take a few minutes and I want to share with you about uh, the good work that God can do in our lives during times of isolation, during times of challenge, and during times of struggle, if, if we let him. And there's the caveat, eh? Um, he's always willing. He always wants to. He's eager to. But if we invite him to do the work he wants to do. So for those of you that have followed Jesus for a long time, you'll be familiar with some Bible stories. <laughs> where characters went through a time of isolation. And even as I say that, I hate to use the word Bible characters because it makes them sound like they're actors in a movie. But these were our brothers, and uh, these stories are true, and this is what God did our lives during a time of isolation. For those of you who are new to the journey of faith and you're not familiar with these Bible characters, I will uh, try and paint a picture for you. We have one man, his name was Moses, and he ended up on the backside of the desert for 40 years. But during those 40 years, God did a powerful work in his life. It was a time of preparation for Moses, and he came out of that window of isolation full of faith and full of the power of God. And he led two million, two million, three million people out of Egypt where they had suffered for 430 years. And then we have David. He had already been anointed king of Israel by Samuel, but he had to go on the run and he had to hide from Saul who wanted to kill him. Now we're not sure how long David was hiding from Saul, but most scholars say probably around seven or eight years. I remember my husband and I've taken several trips into the Holy Land and I remember standing in the wilderness of En Gedi and looking at those caves and thinking, I wonder what it felt like to be David and to know you'd already been anointed king and yet you were running and you were hiding from Saul. But God was preparing David, and he came out of that time of isolation as a man after God's own heart. And while he certainly wasn't perfect, he was arguably the greatest king who ever sat on Israel's throne. And then we have Joseph. He suffered alone, unjustly accused, in prison, isolated. And while everyone had forgotten about Joseph, God, God hadn't forgotten about Joseph. And he was preparing Joseph for a great work. He was preparing him to ascend to the highest position of authority in that land and to actually save the nation of Israel from starvation. And then we have the Apostle Paul. He was isolated in Arabia, but God was preparing him for ministry during that lonely time. Paul would leave that season of three years, they believe, and he would turn the world upside down. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. That time away in isolation had been a time of preparation for Paul, a time of dismantling what he believed and a time of getting to know Jesus intimately. It would change not only his life, but the course of history. But today it seems most appropriate, and you'll know why shortly, where I'm going to turn my attention to the prophet Elijah and see what God did in his life during this time of isolation. I'm going to be reading from uh, 1 Kings 17, verses 1 to 6. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him, and he camped beside the Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Well, the majority of you, you, you don't know me and you certainly don't know where I work, but my husband and I are the directors, as uh, Travis mentioned, of Focus on the Family Canada's Retreat Center, Kareth Retreat Centers. So we have a retreat center about 30 miles outside uh, Calgary, and every month pastors, uh, parachurch leaders, missionaries come, and they have a week there of Sabbath rest. And our retreat center is named Kareth Creek. 
after this story in 1 Kings 17. Leaders come away from what they were doing, they hide away for the week, and the Lord and the hosts that we bring in to help take care of providing for them everything they need while they're resting at the brook Kareth. What's really interesting is the word Kareth actually means a cutting away, a cutting away. Now, if I were to ask kids who grew up in Sunday school, what story they remember most about Elijah. If you were like me, the story I remember, all the pictures were of Elijah standing on Mount Carmel, defeating 450 prophets of Baal. God send it, sends down fire. Elijah slaughters all 450 prophets. And wow, it's amazing. An epic movie worthy moment. But I want to remind you, and this is so important for you and for me to get, that before there was ever a Mount Carmel, a time of victory, time of celebration. There was a Kareth brook, a time of cutting away, a time of isolation. Verse two in the King James Version reads this way. It says, go hide thyself by the brook Kareth. It's really important language here because unlike future references where God will say to Elijah, go and present yourself publicly. Here he says to Elijah, go and hide thyself. And it's really obvious and evident by the language that was chosen is that God had set in his heart to deal with the private places of Elijah's life and ministry, places likely that no one else, or maybe that no one else knew about, places of challenge, places of struggle, places of defeat. Now, we don't know how long Elijah was at the brook Kareth, but most commentary believes it would have been a number of months because scripture tells us that when he went there initially, he was drinking water from the brook, but when it was time to leave, the brook was drying up. So like us here, 2020, he was hidden away for a matter of months. I love to preach a whole sermon on the lessons that Elijah would have learned there, but for the sake of time, let me mention just a few. He would have had to have learned complete dependence on God. It was just he and God. He would have had to have learned patience. I wonder if, like us, Elijah ever thought, how long is this going to be here? How long am I going to be isolated? How long do I have to stay like this? He had to learn humility. The raven was an unclean bird, and yet that was the bird that God provided meat and bread for Elijah. And then he had to learn obedience, first to go to the brook, then to stay at the brook, and then finally when to leave the brook. You know, I don't know if you've known this in your life, but certainly for me, adversity often introduces us to ourselves. Adversity often introduces us to ourselves. And I think it's fair to assume that it would have been for for Elijah a time of cutting away maybe a cutting away of who he thought he was or what he thought he needed. But I want to lean into verse seven, and this is what it says. After a while, the brook dried up and the Lord said to Elijah, now go. And while the comparison is clumsy at best, I want to suggest to you that in some ways our brook is drying up and our time of isolation is coming to an end. And like God called Elijah on, the time is coming for us to move on. Here's my concern, at least for me. I've always been a lover of the seasons, both in nature and in life, and a believer that God has set his heart to accomplish certain things, sometimes specific things during certain seasons of our lives. So while I want to go back to living and I want to go back to working and I want to go back to worshiping, I don't want to go back the same So there is in me, if not a desperation, a longing that God would have accomplished in me, in us, in our children, everything he had had in his heart to do during this time at the Brook Kareth. So how do we determine if that's actually happened? I'm not sure if there's a definite answer to that. So much of what God accomplishes in our life happens underneath the surface. And we sometimes don't even have any cognitive understanding of it until we're down the road of it. We look back and we say, oh, look what God accomplished then. But perhaps like me, you can sometimes sense there is a work not quite completed, an almost done but not quite feeling that settles down on your soul. It feels like this window of time right now is kind of like a tipping point for me. Our our little town is starting to lift restrictions, and I I don't think it's going to be long till we return to some kind of sense of normal. 
So I've decided between all of the things that I need to get accomplished, all of the things on my to-do list, I'm going to take an hour or so this weekend with a coffee in my journal, and I'm going to find a quiet spot, and I'm going to give myself the gift of reflection and to think on and ask myself these questions. And these will be some of the questions that you'll be talking about in your time together in just a few minutes. What have I struggled with most during this time? What have I learned about God during this time? What have I started doing that I need to keep doing? What have I stopped doing that I need to start doing? And maybe most important for this window of time right now, this question, is there anything that you want or need to accomplish in me? Anything that needs to be cut away before I leave this time of isolation. Perhaps that's something that you'd like to consider doing as well. I close with this. The greatest days of Elijah were after he left the Kareth Brook, after the time of cutting away, after the time of isolation. God sees the long plan, friends, and he knew what Elijah would need for the days ahead. Elijah came away refined, a different man. He met himself at the Brook Kareth, and he met God at the Brook Kareth. And after that meeting, he stepped into the most fruitful time of his life and his ministry. May it be the same for all of us.